Luke chapter 24. Today we're going to look at an event that took place immediately following the death, Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection from the tomb. And in this event that we are going to unpack, there are at least three, what I would kind of call broad truths that I think uh, has relevance for your life and mine, particularly within what I would call friendship or friendship interactions. And so for our conversation today, I've titled it Legacy Friends. And so maybe you can just keep in mind or maybe picture in your mind or have in mind these relationships that you have uh, in your life, these close individuals who you would consider to be a friend, and then think about how you are applying or might apply sort of the biblical truths, what we see expounded here in, in those relationships. Now to set the context, I'm going to start reading at verse 1. So this is what we read last week and looked at last week, but we're going to read verse 1 through 12, and then the context of, of, of our friendship, legacy friendship uh, unpacking will happen in, in verses 13 and following. But picture the scene in your mind, Luke chapter 24. I'm going to start reading at verse 1. Very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance, so they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes, some angels. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. Then they remembered that he had said this, so they rushed back from the tomb to tell his eleven disciples and everyone else what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to these men, so they didn't believe it. However, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb, looking, stooping. He peered in and saw the empty linen wrappings. Then he went home again, wondering what had happened. So that's the context of what we're about to read here. That same day, that same day, verse 13, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. Verse 16, but God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all these things that have happened there the last few days. What things? Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah. Have, have you ever had any hopes dashed? You ever, you know, looked forward to something, maybe that new raise or that new promotion or that, you know, new car you were going to get and then something catastrophic happened and it didn't, it didn't work out. Or even worse, you ever lost a child? Some of you, were, some of you moms, you know, or moms wannabes, you know, had a miscarriage or, or dads, you know, you know what it's like to have a desire to have a child or to have some great thing and then it didn't, it didn't work out. You know, you can probably relate to what these, maybe sort of what these relate, these disciples are, are feeling. It says, we had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they had seen angels who told him Jesus is alive. Verse 24 some of our men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Now, let's stop there and write this down. Point number one in your app notes. Legacy friends process 
faith experiences together. Legacy friends process faith experiences together. You know, one of the things that I love about this story is how we see on display for us the church in action. Remember, the church is people, right? It's not a building. You know, one of the purposes of the church, as we read, is to help each other process our faith experiences. So would you write this down, letter A in your notes? My perspective can influence you. And letter B, your perspective can influence me. My perspective can influence you. And your perspective can influence me. My perspective can shape your ideas about something. And your perspective can shape my ideas about something. Legacy friends process faith experiences together. You know, in this Bible story, we see the early church in its infancy. By defeating death and resurrecting from the grave, Jesus has proven to be who he claimed to be, the Son of God, right? The Savior of the world. And in my opinion, it's not hard to understand really why Jesus' followers are a bit bewildered by, by all of this. Their world has just been turned upside down. If you know, if any of you have ever experienced the, the death of a close friend or maybe a family member, then maybe you can relate sort of to the emotions they might have been feeling. But then suddenly we're told here on Easter Sunday morning, a few of Jesus' disciples, they have an encounter with some angels, right? At Jesus' tomb, which is now empty, they're told that Jesus is no longer dead, but alive. And not surprisingly, everybody is trying to make sense of what's going on. The Bible writer describes for us how two of Jesus' disciples are traveling from Jerusalem to a town of Emmaus, which we're told is a, a seven-mile walk, or seven, and so it's what, two hours to walk seven miles if you walk my speed, maybe a little bit longer. Some of you probably could do it in less than that. But I just say it's a seven-mile, two-hour walk. When Jesus, unbeknownst to them, we're told, suddenly joins them on their journey. And as they're conversing, Jesus asks them what they are talking about. Legacy friends process faith experiences together. So look at verse 25. Let's pick up the conversation. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people. That's kind of a harsh thing to say, isn't it? Not very nice on Jesus' part. He says, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all the prophets written in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey, and Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, stay the night with us, since it is getting late. So he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it, then he broke it and gave it to them, and suddenly their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and at that moment, he disappeared." Then they said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem, a seven mile, two hour walk. There they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them. Now write this down, point number two. We all need help in understanding God's word. We all need help in understanding God's word. Here's why. Letter A. Flawed interpretations lead to flawed conclusions. 
Flawed interpretations lead to flawed conclusions, and letter B, insightful explanations lead to transformative actions. Insightful explanations lead to transformative actions. Here in our Bible story, how did Jesus bring clarity to the confusion for these two disciples as they walked and talked from Jerusalem to Emmaus? What does the Bible writer tell us that Jesus did? What's he saying? Verse 27. It said that we're told that Jesus taught them the writings of Moses and the prophets. What are the writings of Moses? Do you know? First five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and what? Deuteronomy. Okay. What are the writings of the prophets? Well, it's the book of Daniel, Hosea, Joel, right? Malachi. The Psalms, basically the entire Old Testament we could consider to be the book of the prophets. So what did Jesus use to provide clarity to the questions that the people had? He used the Bible to answer questions about the Bible. He used the Bible to answer questions about life. And that's, in essence, what we're practicing right now, is it not? Friends, we all need help in understanding God's Word. And I, wanna, I want you to just see very clearly here how Jesus illustrates for us how the Bible is a resource for us to answer life's questions. Which is why it's always important for you and me to ask one simple question. You know what that is? What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? In fact, on the count of three, I'd like you to say that question out loud in unison, okay? On the count of three. One, two, three. What does the Bible say? Have any of you heard of a guy by the name of Jack Hibbs? Pastor Jack Hibbs. My mom loves Jack Hibbs. Uh, Jack Hibbs is a pastor in uh, Chino Hills. He's a pastor of a church called Calvary Chapel. Uh, many times, my, my mom's always asking me, Mike, did you, have you heard Pastor, Jack, uh, pastor Jack's latest sermon? And, and, and uh, I have, it hadn't. And, and prior to this last week, I've never actually listened to Pastor Jack uh, preach. I, I don't listen to a lot of people preaching for whatever reason. It's just uh, it, regardless. A friend recommended that I listen to one of his sermons. So, I followed this person's advice, and I watched one of his sermons online, and I'm glad I did. Because in this particular sermon that Jack did, he talked about 50 prophecies of Jesus in the Old Testament that were fulfilled in the New Testament. And as I'm going to show you some charts. In fact, if you have a phone, you're going to want to take probably a take some screenshots of what we're going to show here on this on the on the uh, screen, because I imagine as Jesus was walking with Cleopas and this other disciple who is unnamed. So we many scholars think it might have been Luke, since Luke's the writing of this gospel. I imagine Jesus kind of going through some of these Old Testament prophecies as he talked to, to these boys. And so, I'm not going to go through every single one, but so prophecy number one, Jesus, the Messiah would be born of a woman, Genesis 3, we see that fulfilled in Matthew 1. He would be born in Bethlehem, Micah the prophet foretold that. We see that in Matthew chapter 2. He would be born of a virgin. He would come in the line of Abraham, a descendant of Isaac and Jacob, and come from the tribe of Judah. All of these are prophecies that were made about the Messiah, fulfilled, as we're told here, in the New Testament. He would be an heir to King David's throne, 2 Samuel chapter 7, reinforced in Luke chapter 1. His throne would be anointed and eternal. He would be called Emmanuel. Remember what the angels declared when Jesus was born? He's Emmanuel. You know, the, 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 the whole great... But anyways, I'll let you read it for it. Matthew 1, 23. Next slide. He would spend a season in Egypt. Remember after Jesus was born that Mary and Joseph, they fled? Yes. 
You know, he spent a season in, in Egypt, Matthew chapter 2. A massacre of children would happen at Messiah's birthplace. Jeremiah the prophet predicted that. What did the king do after he learned of Jesus' birth? He went in and he wiped out all the young boys. This is massacre. A messenger would prepare the way for the Messiah. Isaiah pro uh, predicted that. Who, who is the messenger? John the Baptist, Luke chapter 3. He would be preceded by a forerunner, again, Math, uh, John the Baptist. Math, Messiah would be rejected by his own people. Psalm and Isaiah, we read that as told for us in the Gospel of John and, and even in Luke here. The Messiah would be a prophet, Deuteronomy 18. We're told that in Acts chapter 3. He's called a prophet. He would be preceded by Elijah. He would be declared the Son of God. He would be called a Nazarene. He would bring light to the Galilee. All of these prophecies were given in the Old Testament. Three, four hundred, five hundred, eight hundred years earlier before Jesus ever arrived on the scene. And as we read the Gospels... And I can imagine Jesus, he's walking and he's talking and he's talking. And these, these, these Jewish men, Cleopas and this unnamed disciple, they would have known these scriptures because they had been raised in these Jewish schools. They would have known these prophecies. And now as they're seeing it, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Next one, Beto, 21 to 30. He would speak in parables. Remember, and Isaiah tells us that. Remember in Jesus, the, in, in Matthew 13, I think it, it's the, where the, 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 the disciples say, Jesus, why, do you, why are you so, so confused? Why do you, aren't you more clear? Why do you keep telling all these stories? It's a fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus, number 22, the Messiah would be sent to heal the brokenhearted. Number 23, he would be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. We can read how as a result of Jesus' resurrection, the Bible teaches us, and, and we're told in Hebrews chapter 5, where he's in the order of Melchizedek, which is a priestly, priestly line. All these are fulfilled by Jesus. Number 24, he would be called king. Number 25, the Messiah would enter Jerusalem on his donkey. Zechariah predicted that. And what happened on Palm Sunday? What did Jesus ride? A donkey. It wasn't a horse. It was a donkey. You think Jesus was intentional about his choice of riding? Possibly. The Messiah would be praised by little children. The Messiah would be betrayed. Psalms and Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah predicted that. Who betrayed Jesus? Well, Judas did. Check this one out. Number 28, the Messiah's prize money would be used to buy a potter's field. Zechariah predicted that. And, and with the money that, remember when Judas, after he got the 30 pieces of silver, he went back to the Pharisees and he threw it. And he says, I, I, this is blood money, right? I, I can't take this. I betrayed my, my Savior. And, and the Pharisees said, this is blood money. Let's use it to buy a field for we can bury people who are poor. It was a full prediction or a fulfillment of prophecy. Number 29, the Messiah would be falsely accused. Psalm 35, were fulfilled in Mark 14. Messiah would be silent before his accusers. Isaiah predicted that. And in Mark 15, Jesus was silent. Remember when Jesus was getting beat up, beat up and pummeled, if you know the story? Somebody asked him, don't you have anything to say? He was silent before his accusers. The Messiah would be spat upon and struck. Isaiah pr predicted that. He would be hated without cause. He would be crucified with criminals. Can you imagine that? Isaiah predicted that all those years before. And Jesus had no decision as to who he would be crucified next to. And yet it was a fulfillment of prophecy. The Messiah would be given vinegar to drink. His hands and feet would be pierced. Both King David and Psalm and, and Zechariah predicted that as fulfilled in John chapter 20. The Messiah, number 36, would be mocked and ridiculed. Soldiers would gamble for the Messiah's garments. We're told that in the book of Psalms chapter 22. And that's what happened at his crucifixion. The Messiah's bones would not be broken. Exodus 12, fulfilled in John 19. The Messiah would be forsaken by God. What did Jesus say when he was on the cross? My God, my God, why have you what? Forsaken me. A fulfillment of prophecy. By the way, if you have any Jewish friends who are uncertain about the Messiah, but they believe in the Old Testament, this is, these are some good verses to share with them. This is what you would call science. Unbelievable. 
Number 40, and the Messiah would pray for his enemies. Psalm told us that. And in Luke 23, what did Jesus say? Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Right? Next one, Beto. 41 to 50. Soldiers would pierce the Messiah's side. Zechariah predicted that. What happened when Jesus went to the, was dead on the cross? What the soldiers do? Skewed him with the spear, didn't he? Stuck him in the side. A prophecy fulfilled. The Messiah would be buried with the rich. Isaiah predicted that. Whose tomb did Jesus be, was Jesus buried in? Joseph of Arimathea. It was a rich businessman who asked for Pilate, asked Pilate for Jesus' body, a fulfillment of prophecy. Now here's where it gets good. The Messiah would be resurrected from the dead. Oh, mean those first 42 prophecies came true? Now number 43, he's, what are the chances that this prophecy would come? So suddenly these guys are thinking a lot different as Jesus is unpacking these prophecies. He would ascend to heaven, which was going to happen. He would be seated at God's right hand, which was still to happen at, at the context of this verse and verses in Luke 24. He would hit, the Messiah would be a sacrifice for sin, Isaiah 53, told for us in Romans 5. He would return a second time. Somebody go, woohoo, that's a good thing. Jesus is coming back. He would have to be eternal. He would be publicly worshipped. The Messiah would present him as a king of the Jews, Zechariah 9, fulfilled in Matthew 21.4. Fifty prophecies, brothers and sisters, about Jesus, most of which have been fulfilled, a few yet to take place. And in my mind, I envision Jesus walking and talking and unpacking and explaining these scriptures to these two disciples. And it's easy for us to understand, I think, it's why they felt like their hearts were burning inside because Jesus was opening their minds to the truth of who he is. Brothers and sisters, sometimes we just need a little help to understand God's word. One more passage of scripture. We've got time for it. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And this really reinforces the truth of Jesus' re resurrection. I've got to find it here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Go to verse 3. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. So the Apostle Paul, one of the original Pharisees who was a persecutor of the early church, he gets saved, right? You know the story. And then he's writing this now. He's, years later, he's writing to the church in Corinth, to the early church that had grown in, this, in, this, in the area of Corinth. And he's, he says this. He said, I passed on to you what was most important and what has been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins just as the scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day just as the scriptures said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. What's Paul saying? Jesus is alive, friends. There's no denying. It's not like one person had this random experience. Jesus was over and over seen by multiple people on different occasions. He is very much alive. Verse 7. Then, Paul writes, Jesus was seen by James and later by all the apostles. And last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. Would you write this down as our final point, point number three in your app notes, and that's this. Jesus' resurrection is a friendship affair. Jesus' resurrection is a friendship affair. Friends, the truth of Jesus' resurrection, the truth that Jesus defeated death was witnessed by busloads of people. The Apostle Paul writes here that more than 500 early church followers encountered Jesus' post-crucifixion. And because of that reality, the early church was born. Jesus' resurrection is a friendship affair. In two weeks, and I'll close with this. 
in two weeks, on April the 21st, we're going to have a baptism service right here in this tank. If you ever come up here, there's a tank down here, and it's going to be filled with ice-cold water. <laughs> I've been asking for our heater, our water heater to be fixed for like 13 years and it's still not fixed. So, so James Strode and I are going to get into this ice cold water. Doesn't matter, James. We got it. James is going to get baptized, everybody. At 93, at 93 years young. Are you 93? You're 93, right? 93 years young. James is going to proclaim to the world his new faith in Jesus. It is a friendship affair. When Jesus changes our life, people notice. And there's going to be family, and there's going to be kids and grandkids here, some of whom are maybe a little tentative about Christianity, right? And James and I are going to preach from the baptism tank. Norma said, please don't give him a mic. We're going we're gonna to bring it, James, you and me. We're, we're going to have fun. I hope you'll come. I hope you'll come. And if you have any friends who maybe are on the bubble about who is this Jesus character that you know, you've given your life to or day to, I hope you'll come. I hope you'll come and be a part of this amazing celebration as we get to hear how God's been at work in James's life and come to the place where he wants to declare it publicly. And if you've never been baptized, you know, baptism is an inward, outward expression of an inward decision. Maybe you were baptized as a baby. You were told that, but you don't really remember that. If you're an adult and you come to the place where Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord, I encourage you, if you've not been baptized, to talk to me after the service today, and you can join James and I in that beautifully warm, cool water to let everybody know how Jesus has changed your life. Why? Because Jesus' resurrection is a friendship affair. We all need each other to grow. We all need each other to help us understand what God's word and what did you see and what does what are you saying? What does the Bible say? And that's what we see here on display. It's not complicated, but brothers and sisters, it's a, it's a powerful reminder that I need you in my life, and you need the people around you in your life. And guess what? You might even need me in your life. Why? Because legacy friends do life together. So, with that, we're going to transition to communion. Dave is going to join me on the screen, uh, up here on the stage. Rick and Nancy are going to be at the back. And communion is a time for us to reflect on this truth that Jesus was alive, he was killed, he was resurrected, proving to us that he is the promised Messiah. He has the capacity to forgive our sins. And so, I don't know if any of you committed any sins this past week. I don't know if you did anything that you realize that as you think about it, maybe you, you realize that you fell short of, of maybe God's expectation. If so, I would encourage you as we go to, as you get up and go to the back and get the elements from Rick and Nancy and then you sit in your chair just to spend some time thinking about it. And I would encourage you to say, God, please forgive me for, and then you fill in the blank. And not only that, but then say, God, please help me, and you fill in the blank. Help me to be more gracious. Help me to be more patient. Help me to be more kind, right? Help me to be more loving. Use this time to confess your sins. Use this time to renew your relationship with Jesus. Use this time to invite Jesus to work in your life. We all need Jesus' resurrection power, yes? Friends, Jesus' resurrection is a friendship affair. And so I invite you to get up, go to the back, let Rick and Nancy wash your feet in a figurative sense, come back, and then we'll celebrate communion together. You know, the Apostle Paul also wrote this. He said, every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup... 
you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body of blood of the Lord. He says, that's why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you're eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. He says, that's why some of you are weak and sick and some have even died. So the communion practice as we are recognizing today is symbolic. At the same time, there's something supernatural in it. Where Jesus says, listen, you have a choice. You can, you know, live the life the way that you want to live your life. Just don't, just don't um, dishonor me by taking this special meal, if you will without recognizing the fact that, that you're a sinner. If you want to sin, you want to keep sinning, then go for it. That's, that's, your, that's your choice. But don't come and mock me. When you hold this piece of bread in your, your hand and, and this you know, cup of grape juice in your hand, don't mock me. It's an invitation for you and me to say, God, you know what? Um, I want to be a better person. I need your forgiveness because on my own, I just, I, I lean towards the, the desires of the flesh. What desires of the flesh capture you? Materialism? Um, you have a problem with Amazon, you know, credit card spending? My dad and I used to go around all the time and, and we talk about gluttony. You know, our family, we have a tendency to be a little heavy. It's the German in us. We like our bread and potatoes. But is gluttony a sin that God dishonors God? Our thought life. Not just sexual thought life for those of us who are men, but how about our self-image? You know, we spend so much time trying to look good. God says, I love you. So what are those things that trip you up? You know, God says, I love you. I value you. You're special to me. Um, so as you come, as we take this, this bread and we drink this cup, just say, God, please forgive me for... And then you fill in the blank. Where do you struggle? What are the things that call you away or draw you away from, from God's ways? And then as you hold that cup and you kind of feel that plastic in your hand, for those of you who are here right now, and it represents Jesus' resurrection power. You know, just say, Lord, I could use more of your resurrection power in my life right now. I want to be a better son. I want to be a better daughter. I want to be a better friend. I want to be a better businessman or woman. So Diana has made for us every month these unleavened wafers. It's probably not the right term, but, you know, it's a, it's a symbolic of the Passover deliverance. And so when we eat this bread, it's another reminder of we're connected to this history where Jesus is passing over our sin through the blood of the Lamb. So as we eat and drink today, Celebrate the truth in your own heart that God loves you. He is for you. He is with you. He has forgiven you. He values you. And then he invites you and me to keep growing in our relationship with him and with each other. Eat and drink and celebrate Jesus' resurrection power because resurrection power and his resurrection is a friendship affair. Let's eat and drink.
please stand. Palms out in front of you. Everybody look up here for a second. Brothers and sisters, you are my friends. And my life has been dramatically impacted by your involvement in my life. I need you. And I'm grateful for you. And my blessing for you today is that there are people in your life who feel the same way. They need you. They need your encouragement. They need your relentless support. They need your accountability. They need your love. So I bless you today. In the name of God the Father, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, to be Jesus' hands and feet today and in the days to come. I bless you with an increased measure of capacity to, to love and to forgive and to bring value to people, be value adders. I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Have a great week, everybody.